Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James G. Maynard. Yay! This week we're going to take the first of two looks at the upcoming solar eclipse coming on the 8th of April. Later on the show we're going to be talking with noted physicist, mathematician, and developer Stephen Wolfram about his new book, Predicting the Eclipse. From ancient fears and superstitions to modern day scientific predictions, the history of eclipse forecasting is a captivating tale of human curiosity and ingenuity. Now, have you ever looked up at the sky during an eclipse and wondered, Hey, how did people in the past react to this awe-inspiring sight? Admit it, you know, I know that you have. In the early days of human civilization, eclipses were often seen as ominous events, portending disaster, or signaling the displeasure of gods. Eek! The sun has disappeared! The gods must be displeased! Ancient civilizations around the world had their own unique beliefs about eclipses. For instance, some ancient Chinese people believed that a dragon was devouring the sun and the people would beat on drums to scare the creature away. In the mid-13th century, the Anasazi people living in what is now southwestern Colorado witnessed two solar eclipses in 1257 and 1259, plus a bright comet in 1264. Already plagued by severe drought, the people quickly abandoned their land. Now, it's easy to imagine the fear and confusion these early people must have felt at the sudden darkness coming in the middle of the day. Night in the middle of the day. Does this mean? Yup. Call off the invasion. Now, several cultures told stories that eclipses were the result of the sun being eaten by a celestial creature of one sort or another. Uh, the Norse held that the ravenous beast was a wolf, while people in Vietnam claim it claimed a frog ate the sun. Um, 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 um. <coughs> Hindu mythology talks of the deity Rahu being beheaded for stealing a drink, and as his head flew through the, flies through the sky, he sometimes somehow manages to swallow the sun. But as humanity progressed, so did our understanding of the cosmos. Early scientists and astronomers began to realize that eclipses weren't random events, but rather natural phenomena that could be, that could be predicted and understood. Around the year 150 BCE, scientist philosopher Hipparchus of Nicaea used a solar eclipse to make a pretty good estimate of the size of the Earth. One of the earliest known examples of an eclipse prediction device was the Anticathera Mechanism, an ancient Greek astronomical instrument that could calculate the timing of eclipses with remarkable accuracy. The scientific revolution of the Renaissance brought even more advancements in eclipse forecasting. Astronomers like Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei developed new mathematical models and observational techniques greatly increasing the precision of eclipse predictions. No longer were eclipses seen as scary omens, but rather as opportunities to study the sun, the moon, and the stars in new and exciting ways. Fast forward to the present day, and eclipse prediction has become incredibly sophisticated. Scientists like Stephen Wolfram use advanced computer models and complex algorithms to forecast eclipses with astonishing accuracy. These predictions are not only fascinating from a scientific perspective, but they also have practical uses in fields like navigation, communication, and satellite management. Next up, we talk with Stephen Wolfram about his new book, Predicting the Eclipse. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's a yeah. cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, 
authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Hmm. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by the creator of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha, and the Wolfram Language. He's the originator of the Wolfram Physics Project, as well as the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research. Please welcome, he has a new book out, Predicting the Eclipse. Please welcome to the show, Stephen Wolfram. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for being on the show, Stephen. It's great talking with you. Pleased to be here. Yeah. All right. So uh, you've done as you say, a whole lot in sciences and mathematics and uh, computer programming, but uh, what inspired you to write this book? Well, this this book was the I was curious about the history of predicting eclipses because I had always known that this was kind of a a a big thing that was sort of a big success of science to know when exactly will the eclipse will happen. There are not a lot of things we can predict that well, but we can you know it's it's something. But it's it took a couple of thousand years to learn how to predict eclipses as well as we can now predict them. And I was curious, particularly coming up to the 2017 eclipse that was visible in the US, uh, how had this really happened? And so I wanted to trace that history. And that's, uh, that's what led me to try and write out the history in this book. And the history actually turned out I knew many parts of that history, but uh, the history is sort of more distinguished than I knew in the sense that many of the most famous names in mathematics and physics have been involved in eclipses, and I didn't even know that. Um, it's uh, so that was kind of a a, a fun thing to discover. But it, it's also something where kind of uh, people uh, the the that one is interested. I've been interested in sort of what can we compute about the world, and some of my you know I've spent a lot of my life trying to build things that can compute. All sorts of things about data and and uh, and formulas and and so on, and um, I've even been in recent years involved in figuring out how one can compute things about fundamental physics and sort of what the what the fundamental computational kind of foundations of of uh, everything we know about the universe are. But eclipses sort of stand out as being this thing that, in the history of science, has been kind of the most impressively computed over the course of the last couple of thousand years that people have been doing what we can think of as science. Hmm. And as you, I mean, as you alluded to, I mean, the, the human desire to predict eclipses goes way back. I mean, we even had the Antikythera mechanism more than two yeah, right. years ago. Right. No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we, uh, uh, the 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 sort of the the first example that we know of something like a computer comes from a couple of thousand years ago, found in a shipwreck in 1900, actually, uh, probably from around zero A.D., so to speak. Uh, this little thing about the size of one's hand or something that people didn't know what it was until somebody dropped it sometime in the 1950s. It broke in two, and people noticed, oh my gosh, there are cogs sticking out of this, the pieces of this of this lump of corroded crud, so to speak. And then uh, 
uh, in recent years with all kinds of CT scanning and so on, it's been figured out what's inside all that crud, and it's a bunch of cogs. And what do these cogs do? Well, it wasn't clear at first. They kind of look like a mechanical computer, but actually what they're doing is they're, they're making, they're computing things about the positions of the, the sun and the uh, moon, and they have a little, in, you know, it's written in Greek with a capital sigma and a, a capital eta, and um, the, these are these are indicating the um, uh, the the you know the, uh, the the position of the you know the, the the pieces that indicate this is where the sun is, this is where the moon is, and this little device gives you sort of a first approximation to when can eclipses happen, and that was uh, it's kind of a weird thing because there's there's uh, the 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 idea of computers didn't really originate until recent times as far as we knew until it was discovered that there had been sort of a precursor of this, of which there's just one example from antiquity, and that example was already used as a thing for computing eclipses. I mean, people had known kind of, there was a lot of data about what happens in the heavens, so to speak. The Babylonians were very concerned about this. I mean, it's always kind of interesting that in Babylonian times, there were kind of three things people wanted to predict. They wanted to predict where will that planet be? They wanted to predict will it rain tomorrow? And they wanted to predict who will win that battle or not, and it's kind of it's kind of fun that you know, and there in those days, the astrologers, as they were at that time, they were kind of into all of those predictions. Turns out, you know, the who will win that battle, we don't know how to predict that. Will it rain tomorrow? We've gotten in recent years pretty good at predicting that. And the thing about where will the planets be, we really nailed that one. That one is one that that. Uh, you know, that science really managed. We can we can check that one off, but um, in those days they didn't know which one was going to be easiest to predict. But what they did do was they collected all kinds of data of every every night for seven hundred years. The Babylonians recorded these astronomical diaries that said, "Where's the moon? Where where are, where are those various planets? And by the way, what's the height of the river? The price of grain and a few other things." And a couple of percent of those tablets have survived to today. And so we can kind of piece together what they said. And from that, people started to notice these kind of long, long time regularities. And the, the uh, for example, one, you know, there are these cycles that were seen in the positions of the moon and so on. When did the moon come back to where it had been before and so on? And that was kind of the, the earliest efforts to, to be able to do things like predict eclipses. I mean, just just to fill in kind of the the physics of what's going on, why are there eclipses, right? So the basic thing is there's an eclipse when the moon gets in front of the sun as we look at it from the Earth, and the the, the question is, why is that? Why does that happen? Why does it? Why is that rare? I mean, the thing is that the if you look at the planets, the planets are orbiting the sun and they're more or less all in the same plane. You know, when the when the solar system was formed. Probably there was this sort of big accretion disk of, of of stuff around the sun, and because it was spinning around, it got flattened out, just like a galaxy gets flattened out. It's all pretty flat. So the planets formed out of that, and mostly the planets are just sort of all going around in this one plane. And if everything is going around in one plane, then that means that if, if the moon was in that same plane, then every time, every lunar month, every 28, 29 days, when the, the moon goes around the Earth to a particular position, it would be in front of the sun, and, the, and it would obscure the sun, and there'd be an eclipse. And that's what happens on other planets. For example, on, on, uh, on Jupiter, Ganymede, the biggest moon of Jupiter, is, is, is big enough relative to the sun from Jupiter that every, every time Ganymede goes around Jupiter, if you were on the surface of Jupiter, there would be an eclipse, and the sun would be covered. And on Mars, same kind of thing, except that the moons of Mars are really tiny, tiny yeah. so so you don't they, they go in front of the sun, but you barely notice. Just like for us, you know, Mercury goes in front of the sun, but we barely notice, so to speak. But the moon is when it goes in front of the sun. It so happens that the the size of the moon in the sky is more or less exactly equal to the size of the sun in the sky. That's a, just a coincidence of our times, you know. For the dinosaurs, the moon was a bit bigger because it was closer to the Earth. In the distant future, the moon is going to be smaller relative to the, the sun, and there won't be the same kinds of total eclipses we have today. So we should enjoy them while we can. In 100 million years, 
we won't be able to enjoy them anymore. Although other things will have changed by then too. But um, I think the um, the thing that uh, so the question is why is it the case that the moon doesn't just go in front of the sun when viewed from the Earth every lunar month? And the answer is because unlike most moons in the solar system, the orbit of the moon is tipped relative to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. I think it's about five degrees of of tipping. And you know why is that? Well, we don't really know for sure. Presumably, it has something to do with the way the moon was formed. I mean, the current favorite theory of the formation of the moon is this big splat theory that says, you know, when the when the Earth was just forming, there was something kind of probably about the size of Mars that that bashed into the 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 proto Earth, so to speak, made the whole thing liquefied the whole thing, and when it sort of came to came uh, sort of re re cooled down. There were two lumps of stuff. One was what's now the Earth. One was what's now the Moon. And probably a piece of the Moon comes from that impactor that that hit the Earth. And that's why this kind of when you look at when satellites orbit the Moon, there's kind of the their orbits don't go at a fixed height because there's a piece of the Moon that has different gravity from other parts of the Moon. That's probably why that right. happened. I mean, we we don't know when that when the Moon was formed. We don't know there may have been three moons of the Earth when the Moon was originally formed. We don't know that. Um, and we just lost the other two, and we're 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 stuck with the one that we have right now. But the main main effect of all of this is the moon's orbit is tipped by about five degrees relative to the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and so that means that when the when the moon goes a, around the Earth, most of the time it isn't in the right place to be between the Earth and the sun, and there isn't an eclipse, and so an eclipse happens when the the uh, orbit of the moon is, is such that it is in the same plane as the orbit of the Earth, and it is between the Earth and the Sun. So it's a, at the time of the new moon, when, when the, that's, the new moon is when, when, from the, when the Sun is, is behind the moon, so to speak, and we're, we're looking at the, um, uh, and that, that's, that's the time when we might have an eclipse, but the moon has to be lined up with the uh, with 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 the plane of the of the orbit of the Earth, and so that happens rarely. It happens. Uh, uh, it's kind of a tricky thing because there are these different periods, like the moon going around the Earth. In you know, new moons are like twenty nine and a half days apart. Mm -hmm. The time when the the uh, the moon goes th uh, at the right sort of uh, through this the plane of the orbit of the Earth every I think twenty seven and a half days, roughly. And the thing is, when will those things line up? How many sort of orbits around? Uh, at what at what point will you have kind of will you will you line up those two those two numbers? And it turns out the sort of a big fact about eclipses are these things called the Saros cycles. And it turns out every about eighteen years, in pretty close approximation, I think you have like two hundred and thirty-two. Of the new moon thing and 243 maybe of the uh, uh, sort of moon going between you know going at the right sort of uh, place to be in the in the same plane as the as the orbit of the Earth and so it's kind of when those numbers line up then you're back in the same situation with the moon in the same place so if you have an eclipse now then you'll typically have an eclipse 18 years later give or take. And then another one 18 years after that. And there are these whole series of eclipses. And those series, things don't line up precisely. But that series of every 18 years you have an eclipse, that usually lasts maybe 1,300 years or so. So, for example, the eclipse we're going to see on April 8th, I think that eclipse comes from a Soros series that started around 1,500 and will continue going until about 2,700. And it's kind of... To me, it's it's sort of a remarkable thing that we can say there's this thing that's precisely just de determined, and you know it started 500 years ago, and it's going to be keeping on going, you know, uh, 700 years into the future, so to speak. That's a that's a remarkable sort of precision of the way that the way that physics, the universe, is sort of put together. But but the um, uh, so that that's kind of the 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 the, the thing that you do in sort of. Uh, that's that's the first approximation to predicting eclipses is you know one happened another one's going to happen 18 years later and so on where that eclipse will be on the earth is a whole different question mm -hmm. so i mean when the you know the moon goes in front of the sun it casts a shadow on the earth 
everything's moving. The moon's moving in its orbit. The Earth is turning on its axis. The Earth is moving in its orbit. It's all a lot of lot of complicated stuff going on. And you know, you have to try to work out: Will that shadow from the moon actually hit the Earth, or will it miss? If it misses, there won't be an eclipse. If it hits the Earth, if you're right where it hits the Earth, then you'll see an eclipse. And when it when it hits the Earth, that that uh, the the moon is moving in its orbit, the Earth is is rotating. The shadow moves at one or two thousand miles an hour, depending on exactly where on the Earth it hits. And so when you're you know if if you're at a particular place on the Earth, I mean I've seen this a couple of times with eclipses now. You see if you're in a place where there's going to be a total eclipse where you're going to be completely in the shadow of the moon, you see the 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 front of that uh, piece of of shadow coming towards you at a thousand miles an hour when uh, just before the eclipse happens, and then then the lights go out, so to speak. It's dark for a few minutes, depending on exactly where you are, and uh, then you know then the shadow moves off and moves on to to other places, so to speak. But that's that's um. Uh, and and the typical thing is that you know an eclipse will happen one place on the Earth, and the 18 years later eclipse will happen a little bit closer to the South Pole, a little bit closer to the North Pole, and eventually after you've gone through that series of eclipses, you kind of miss the Earth. You kind of the last eclipse of the series is at the South Pole or at the North Pole, and that's that's kind of the um, uh, the the way that 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 works. And it's always um, you know this question of okay, so can you actually predict when the eclipse is going to happen? For the 2017 eclipse, we thought let's see if we can predict it to within one second, which turns out to be pretty hard. Right. And but we got it. There's we have this nice website precisioneclipse.com, which um, uh, is now all set up for the eclipse coming in on April 8th. Um, and uh, you know if you tell it where you are. It should be able to tell you exactly when the eclipse will arrive, and uh, if it isn't right, send us a message. Um, but uh, it's um, uh, it better be right. What's <laughs> tricky? I mean, to get it right to that precision, one needs to take account of all kinds of things, and there's been a sort of a long history in figuring out how to get something like that right. I mean, at the beginning, in Babylonian times, it was just oh, we noticed these uh, these periods and so on these. These cycles, and that was when people like Ptolemy. Ptolemy was sort of one of the the the, the sort of great organizer of astronomy, 150 A.D. or so, um, and uh, he had these tables that sort of told you what was supposed to happen in the heavens, and he had some amount of information about the position of the moon, and uh, and so on. Then, the thing that really uh, uh, sort of that got better. And people had better measurements and so on. You know, Kepler had a big set of tables. I think his was 17, 1627 or so. He had his uh, his tables, which gave a, a pretty good calculation of the position of the moon and so on. But then the real question is, can you not just measure these cycles and things? Can you actually like use math to predict the position of the moon? And that was the thing that started to happen in 1687 when Isaac Newton came up with his uh, laws of motion and his law of gravity and so on. And, and that it's kind of, these are sort of mathematical principles. That's what he called his book, you know, Principia Mathematica, mathematical principles of natural philosophy. How can you use math to figure out how things in the world work? That was kind of his big idea. And um, the the thing that, that uh, uh, that he had sort of two big pieces to that. One was kind of how would things move? Things will just keep going in a straight line unless they're, they're pushed by some force. It wasn't obvious in his day because most things that were just sort of on the earth would have been slowed down by friction. The fact that mm -hmm. you were kind of imagining that in an idealized situation, the thing would just keep going unless you pushed it somehow was not an obvious thing. But that was that was the thing that that he suggested. And then his second big thing was and an his idea of how gravity works, that when you have two massive objects that they attract each other with a force of gravity that's proportional to the inverse square of the distance between them. So one over the, the distance between them squared. That was that was sort of his big, big formula, so to speak. And given that, it was just a question of calculate where the planets are going to be, where comets are going to be, where the moon is going to be, and so on. 
And to do that calculation, he invented calculus. And then he tried to do those calculations. And he did really well on calculating the orbits of comets, did well on computing the orbits of planets. He really wanted to compute the position of the moon. Mm -hmm. And the, re the reason he really wanted to compute the position of the moon is sort of interesting, which was people really wanted to know where the moon was for navigation, for ships on the ocean. It's like in modern times, you want to know where you are, use your GPS. In earlier times, we didn't have GPS. And, you know, you wanted to know where were you latitude-wise on the Earth? How far were you between, between the equator and the pole? How, how, what, was, at what latitude were you? Well, you could figure that out by just looking at how high does the sun get in the sky? But if you wanted to know the longitude, how far east or west were you? That was really hard to work out. And the idea was... If one knew exactly where the moon was supposed to be, you just look at the moon and you see where is it relative to the stars, and you just look in your table and you say, oh, when the moon is at this position relative to the stars, then that means that the that I must be at this position on the Earth. It must be this time, um, and that was that was kind of the that was the idea. The problem was you couldn't figure out where the moon was supposed to be accurately enough, and uh, the. Um, and the, the sort of plan B was you just measure what time it, it is everywhere. Uh, you measure what the time is accurately, and then you can figure out longitude from the position of the sun. The problem was if you take your average pendulum clock and you take it on a random ship that's being bounced around by the ocean, it's not going to keep good time. And that was a thing that was finally solved in the mid-1700s. Finally, there were marine chronometers that could kind of keep time even when they were being bounced around. But the early idea was, you know, use the position of the moon to figure that out. So, so Newton, for example, was really keen to, to work that out. And he had, uh, uh, he, in his, you know, he thought, I've got the math, I'm going to be able to figure out the position of the moon. It didn't work. And in fact, one of the things that's sort of a, a lesson in history of science was that, uh, you know, in the in the at least later editions of his book, he has this whole long section where he says he has this kind of statement. He has a very kind of uh, he likes to give kind of propositions about what he'll do. And one of his propositions is all these formulas are enough to tell you the position of the moon. But then he actually says, and now let me show you how you actually compute it. Has this whole long discussion. At the end of it, he says, "Well, the apse of the moon is twice as fast." In other words, it's wrong by a factor of two. That's the end of the chapter. Um, and, uh, you know, people might say, so if you got it wrong by a factor of two, how come, you know, why should we believe the rest of your theory? Um, that didn't happen. And that was uh, sort of a, 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 it took another century and a half before people actually got that calculation right. And it was the reason it, it, it's just mathematically complicated. And uh, it's, I think, a, a sort of a fundamental feature of a lot of things that one comes up with in, in science, where you say, I've got this, this set of rules for computing this thing, but how do I actually do the computation? That can still be difficult. And, uh, and so it was in this case. I mean, the, the, you know, what Newton solved was this so-called two-body problem. You know, you have a, a star, you have a planet, and you're trying to figure out, you know, how will the, the planet orbit the star? And the big result which Kepler had kind of guessed, the big result is the planet goes in an ellipse. The, the orbit is always an ellipse. Um, it's usually pretty close to a circle, but it's a little bit smooshed and it's, it's an ellipse. But then the problem was, well, the, if you want to solve the problem of the motion of the moon, you have to be able to solve a three-body problem dealing with the Earth, the sun, and the moon. And each one of them has a gravitational effect on the others, and figuring out how that dance works is really hard. And that the three-body problem, it was sort of the, the key problem of mathematical physics through the 1700s and most of the 1800s. If you were a kind of a, you know, a good mathematical physicist, that's what you wanted to solve was the problem of the moon. And um, that was, uh, and people, you know, and a lot of things were invented to, to do that. It was, uh, you know, I, th I think, that finally, uh, kind of, a lot of fancy math got done. A lot of people would fill, you know, if you think you work out, I don't know, some some algebra problem that you might learn in school, and, and the answer is uh, some little thing you can write down a line or so, 
to work out positions of of uh, of the moon and so on, you're dealing with a whole book of algebra. It's a whole the formulas that are involved are kind of uh, that people tried to work out are kind of a whole book long. I mean that worked out really well in the discovery of Neptune, for example. People had looked at the orbits of other planets, particularly Uranus, and they said the orbit of Uranus is not what you would expect based on the gravitational effect of the existing planets. And then these two guys, Adams and Leverrier, both they filled more or less books with published books with algebra that said this is what the orbit should be and it isn't quite like that. And but if you assume there's another planet, then then uh, the orbit has gotten right. And people looked at the place where they said there might be the other planet, and by golly, there was Neptune, and that planet was discovered, and that was that was a success. But that was actually easier than the problem of solving the for the position of the moon. The, the moon was a, a more difficult case, and because it's just you know you, you you kind of when you do these mathematical calculations, you kind of say I'm going to take this approximation. And then I'm going to take a, sort of a smaller correction to that and a smaller correction to that and a smaller correction to that. And you end up with these long sequences of, of things. And the, the real killer problem is a kind of a mathematical problem that when you think you have this series of, of decreasingly important terms, one of the nasty things that happens in celestial mechanics is that the term you think isn't important is multiplied by the time. Mm, and so right. when the time as as the time gets larger, you know, it works for a year, it works for two years, but by the time you're a century out, the even though this term is, you know, a tiny thing, 0. 0.0001 or something, it's multiplied by this thing that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually that term becomes important, and your calculation is you can no longer make the approximations you made, and it's it's hard to do the calculation. But so people in um uh, the the sort of it got things got better and better and by um, well by the beginning of the 20th century, all of these kind of work out these sort of calculations with with more and more terms got done. I mean there were uh, still there weren't computers. This was all done by hand, and uh, eventually there was a uh, uh, these tables made by a chap called Brown that uh, were pretty accurate. They were a big pain to use because every time you wanted to know the position of the moon, you had to do 1,400 calculations to get the position of the moon. So that was that was really a um, a pretty impractical thing, and that was actually an early use for electronic computers mm. was to automate those tables and to say, okay, we can now go and and uh, and add this up and find out what the position of the moon will be, and that was that was the thing by the time um, uh, by. Well, I think by 1925, there was an eclipse that was visible from New York City. And there was sort of a big issue of would that eclipse be computed correctly? And it was. It was more or less right. Um, the, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, right to within a minute, something like this. So that was, um, you know, by, by that point, it was, uh, uh, and that was all done with these kind of complicated hand calculation and so on. And then... Well, people that same those same tables were used up through the 1960s, and then you know in the 1960s uh, the the big thing was we need to know where the moon is because we want to send a spacecraft there, and if we don't know where the moon is, we're going to miss the moon, and that would be really bad. Um, so there was a big effort for the Apollo program to kind of uh, take these tables, put them on computers, try and recalculate these tables using. Uh, algebraic computation, making a computer work out the algebra rather than having humans work out the algebra, and that was uh, uh, that was that kind of it kind of more or less takes one to the state of the art today. I mean, the the thing that um, uh, today it's it's uh, instead of adding up fourteen hundred of those uh, terms and so on from those tables, it's more like twenty thousand. It's sort of ironic because each of those terms is kind of like like what you would get by having kind of a, a gear wheel that is that has a certain size and it's connected to some other gear wheel. And you're kind of, it's like you have 20,000 gear wheels, except it's being done on a computer. And the thing that's particularly ironic about that is back in the time of Ptolemy, Ptolemy had this whole theory of how the planets moved that said they're all on these epicycles Epicycle. and you know, it's crystal spheres in the sky, so to speak. And it's all kind of the epicycles have a certain has a have a certain sizes and and this and that and the other, 
And it's sort of ironic that today, when we actually compute the position of the moon, it's done inside a computer, but using the equivalent of 20,000 epicycles. Um, even though the way that those things were derived uses kind of the whole modern theory of how, how gravity works and all that kind of thing. But in the end, the calculation is kind of the same thing, but a fancier version of what Ptolemy was doing. I mean, when, when you do the calculation today, there are lots of things you have to take account of. I mean, it's kind of like we know uh, where the moon is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but we, we have to know what are the gravitational effects of things like, like Jupiter. That's the biggest effect, actually. After the three-body problem, it's not really a three-body problem because you've got Jupiter out there. I think Jupiter is like one part in 100,000 um, is, is its effect. And you, you have other effects, like another big effect is, uh, comes from relativity theory. And it's the fact that uh, you know, it, takes, it takes light about eight minutes to come from the, from the sun to the earth. And when you ask the question, when you're trying to work out where are these planets going to be, where are these, these, uh, the moon and so on going to be, there's a gravitational effect of one thing on another, but gravity travels also at the speed of light. So when you say, what's the direction that the gravity is going to be pulling things in? Well, it depends on where the moon was a couple of seconds ago, not where you think it quotes is now. And so that's another effect that's a little bit smaller than the, the effect of Jupiter, but that's another effect you have to take account of. So there, there's a whole hierarchy of these kinds of effects that you need to, you need to get right. I mean, there are other effects like the solid tides of the Earth and Moon. That you know, the, the tide on the Earth, the Moon's pulling on the Earth as a whole, but it's pulling the the water and the oceans that are a little bit closer on the on the side of the Earth that's closer to the Moon get pulled more. Than the, than the water on the side of the Earth that's away from the moon. And that causes this sort of deformation of the water on the Earth. And that's what leads to tides. That same effect actually smooshes the rock in the Earth and the moon just a little bit. And that has an effect on, on, um, uh, on these kinds of things about the position of the moon that you need to get eclipses right. And it's, so it's a, it's, it's a fairly tricky thing. And, and you can get down the final thing that kind of is is sort of there are other effects like for example refraction through the atmosphere that as the as the sunlight comes comes through the the uh, the atmosphere it's bent slightly just like when you know when light goes into water it's you can see you know you put a stick in in water and things and the and the stick looks like it's bent because the the light is not going in a straight line as it goes into the water it's 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 uh, it's turning and that same thing happens when light enters the atmosphere. And that that has and why, you know, you have all kinds of effects about, you know, at sunset, the sun looks squashed and things like this. That's there's a there, there are a bunch of effects to do with that. And I think the um, the thing that uh, that's that's kind of another thing. Then you have to know things like how high are you going to be on the Earth? Because if you're on the top of a mountain, you know, the sun sort of reaches you before being uh, low down, so to speak. Then, if you want to know the, 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 the final kinds of things are things like, well, when is this eclipse actually going to arrive? You know, there's a clock that's determined by the, by the motion of the moon and so on. But then there's also, you know, the watch that you have on your wrist or whatever. How does the time that we get, you know, on our timepieces, on our, on our phones or whatever else, how does that time line up with the time that is defined by things like the motion of the moon? And that's tricky because, you know, we just had, uh, you know, this year, uh, you know, it was a leap year. And that's a reflection. The fact that we even have leap years is a reflection of trying to keep aligned sort of our days of the year with the actual rotation of the Earth around the, uh, around the sun and so on. Because, you know, the year isn't, you know, 365 days long. It's 365.2481, I think, days long, roughly. Um, and that's it's kind of like the the uh, that we're trying to keep that aligned. But there are the more sort of more detailed alignment that you need if you want to kind of sort of align astronomical clock with human clocks. You eventually have to worry about things like leap seconds. Like since I think 1970, there have been I think 27 leap seconds, and that means that happens because the Earth, the rotation of the Earth, is slowing down. But how much it slows down 
depends on all kinds of things. It depends on what earthquakes have happened. It depends on uh, various, um, it, it can depend on lots of, lots of details about the earth, so to speak, which we don't know in advance. And so every couple of years, the sort of the international time organization puts a leap second or takes away a leap second to try and keep the, uh, the actual motion of the earth aligned with, with, with keep, keep kind of our timekeeping aligned with the actual motion of the earth. So if you want to know when the eclipse is going to arrive to within a second, you have to know about leap seconds. And um, that's, so that's, you know, that's kind of a, the next level of detail. And actually the final level of detail, which, which we haven't figured out is um, uh, when the, when the moon is about to cover the sun, the, uh, there's the question of, of uh, what, you know, where does the light from the sun still make it past the moon? And the answer is, when there's a mountain on the moon, there's that the mountain will be will sort of obstruct more of the sun. When there's a valley, it'll obstruct less. And so there's these things called Bailey's beads, which are the little last points where you see light coming through the through the from the moon, because those are the places where there are valleys basically on the moon. I mean, the mountains on the moon are a bit taller relative to the moon than mountains are on the earth. Um, and uh, so you have to, to really finally nail it. You kind of have to figure out things about the topography of the moon and things about the, how the rays from the sun come relative to the mountains on the moon. But that effect is smaller than a second. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and there are other, there's, there's, there's other things about uh, atmospheric refraction and so on and whether, you know, what exact air currents there are in the upper atmosphere and so on that have effects on the same, same, kind, of, same kind of scale. So it's a, it's been a, you know, it's a, it's a tricky problem to know when the eclipse is actually going to arrive, and um, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's kind of a, a big triumph for, for our kind of ability to calculate things in science that we can figure it out. It's worth perhaps the, the you know, the three body problem, which is the thing we're kind of fighting against to get these calculations done. There's sort of a question of, will somebody come along one day and just say, hey, I solved it. Here's a formula for the three-body problem. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that can never happen. There have been a series of, of times, mostly 100 years ago or so now, when people learned that certain kinds of formulas that would just solve the three-body problem weren't viable. But the thing that is now kind of a, a sort of a, a deeper question of science is, you know, you have the equations, you know the rules by which the thing operates, can you just always figure out what it's going to do? Can you kind of jump ahead, you know, given the rules, you go step by step by step to figure out the consequence of those rules. Can you jump ahead and just say, I know what's going to happen a billion steps in the future. You don't have to work out all those steps. And it's sort of a, there's, there's kind of a fundamental fact about sort of theory of how computation works that says, I mean, this is a thing that I figured out in the 1980s, there's this phenomenon called computational irreducibility, mm. which is this phenomenon whereby you really can't jump ahead in many cases and say, this is what the answer is going to be. You have to follow the steps, which is kind of not, uh, you know, for us kind of leading our lives and sort of going through time, that's in a sense, what the, that, that's what the passage of time is, I think. It is the sort of progressive computation of the next state of the universe, so to speak. And the fact that you can't just jump ahead and say, oh, I know what the answer is, it's 42 or whatever, is the, the, is, it makes the passage of time meaningful. If you could just jump ahead and say, I know what's going to happen at any time in the future, that sort of wouldn't be, wouldn't be as exciting to live through the actual time as it progresses. So I think it's, it's um, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility, which limits what we can work out scientifically, but it also has the feature that the process that we go through to sort of get there is, a, is an irreducible process that is sort of has some, some intrinsic meaning to it, so to speak. So that, that's some, uh, and, but this three body problem, I think is, is an example of the phenomenon of computational irreducibility. That's kind of, that's kind of why it's, why you can't jump ahead and figure out what's going to happen. I mean, in the case of the earth, moon and sun, if you sort of plot the motion of those things, it's, 
fairly regular. It has little glitches in it, which are why it's hard to work out. But if you just take three sort of idealized stars or something and say, what, will, what kind of dance will they go through under gravity? What you find is that in many cases, it's incredibly complicated. They're sort of wiggling around in incredibly complicated ways. If you look at it, you can't figure out what's going to happen. Sometimes, you know, one star will get ejected. Sometimes uh, all the stars will, will go off in different directions, but you can't figure out what's going to happen. And that's kind of this, this computational irreducibility thing. Unfortunately, in the, in the math of this, the, uh, the fact that sort of the way one works out things with a three-body problem is all to do with calculus and the sort of dealing with sort of numbers that can be, uh, that, that are kind of infinitely precise that is what you deal with in calculus is different from what you intrinsically deal with in thinking about computers, which are discrete and digital, and sort of merging those things together is just technically difficult. And so one hasn't been able to figure out, nail down for sure, oh, there's, there's computational irreducibility in this, in this system. Hmm. Um, so I'm curious how you feel that generative artificial intelligence could in help inform those answers we're looking for and help us predict eclipses and the position of the moon better. Right. Actually, funny you asked that because I just did some work figuring this out. The, the, so what you might think is, okay, you know, we can follow these equations. We figure out what's happening. It's really hard to go through all these equations, but let's just feed it to a neural net. Let's, you know, what, what do we do with neural nets? W what we do is we say, here are a bunch of examples of something that are specific examples. Now you ask the neural net, you've seen all these examples. Let me give you a new case. Can you see what will happen in that new case? So for example, when you're looking at something like ChatGPT, it's been given a trillion words from the web. And it's, you know, when you say the cat sat on the, what's the next word? It's effectively saying, well, I've looked at all these things on the web and chances are the next word is gonna be Matt based on all these pages I've seen on the web. But what's tricky is that, that a lot of things you might ask it, it will never have explicitly seen on the web. So it has to have some sort of internal model of what's going on. And the fact that its internal model comes up with sort of things to say that are similar to what we humans say are reasonable things to say, that's a non-trivial scientific fact. Nobody expected that to work. And presumably the reason it works is because the structure of neural nets as we build them in computers are similar enough to the structure of how our brains work that they conclude sort of the same things that our brains conclude. So, so that's kind of why something like ChatGPT works because it's doing a very human thing in a very human way. Now you have something like the three body problem. It's got no human connection at all. It's just working out a bunch of math. And you can ask the question, if you use the same kind of based on examples, can you predict what will happen? Does it work? The answer is no. Hmm. The answer is what happens is you get something which looks roughly right. Kind of like ChatGPT will say things that are roughly right, but in detail, they're nonsense. And so that happens with a three body problem. And unfortunately, if it's roughly right, but in detail nonsense, it's not good enough to know when the eclipse will happen. I mean, this is actually a, a good example of a place where kind of the, the kind of uh, sort of get it roughly right, the way humans get things roughly right, just doesn't do it. This is a case where sort of the precise science thing is what you need. And uh, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's a, an interesting question. There are little places where, you know, in the way that the calculations are done and things, there are sort of, that there, there are places where you can kind of figure out better ways to, to sort of arrange numbers so that you have to do less calculations. You know, for example, here's a, here's a standard kind of thing. If you learn how to do long multiplication, which I'm not sure that anybody does anymore, but if you do, then you've got, you know, one list of, of digits, and you've got another list of digits. And to do long multiplication, you have to kind of take every digit and, and, and uh, in one row, and you have to sort of combine it with every digit in the other row. And there's, if you have, uh, you know, n digits, you'll have n squared comparisons to make, n squared things. So every time, as you increase the number of digits, let's say you have four digits, it might be sort of a 16 amount of effort. If you have 10 digits, it might be a 100 amount of effort and so on. Well, 
it turns out that if you're a little bit trickier about it, you don't need to do all those all those comparisons. You can reduce the number of calculations you have to do by using the fact you've sort of already done some of those calculations and you can reuse them. And learning how to do that is something that is sort of a little bit AI-like. It's not not really, neural nets don't seem to be terribly useful for that. What's useful is to do something very non-human, which is to just enumerate, start enumerating all the possibilities. Just say, how could you combine it? How could you use this? How could you use that? And you go through trillions of possibilities. And then suddenly you find one where you say, wow, that's one that I never thought of. And that's one where we can reduce the number of calculations we have to do. And now let's just keep using that. And we'll be able to do, do our calculations better than we would expect it to do. And, and some people would view that kind of effort as something sort of informed by something like artificial intelligence. But the modern version of, of AI, the modern version that involves neural nets and so on, isn't so relevant to those kinds of things. So interesting. And um, so out, I guess I was I'm trying to think about how to say this, but um, what do you feel are still some of the maybe the biggest misconceptions that people have about about eclipses? Hmm. I think, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think people sort of have the realization that, you know, it's the moon coming between the sun and the earth and that part they get. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I have to say the first eclipse I saw was a partial solar eclipse that was, uh, I saw when I was six years old and, um, this is an outrageously long time ago. And in those days, you know, at least in England, kids would walk to school on their own. So I did. And, and you know, I noticed I'm walking to school and I notice, you know, underneath some tree, there are just these weird shaped shadows. You know, I hadn't really realized that, you know, when you see dappling, sort of dappled spots of light under a tree, right. that those are right. little approximate images of the sun, the sun. Right. except when the sun has a big bite taken out of one side of it, they are all little crescent shapes. And it looks really weird. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed mm -hmm. this looks really weird. Mm -hmm. And so then you know, a few minutes later, I, I get to school and I'm like telling all these other kids, look, you know, there's this, I, I mean, I knew enough. I don't actually know how I knew this, but I knew enough about sort of sciencey type stuff to have figured out this is, you know, an eclipse and you could kind of see the sun. It had a you know, a big chunk taken out of it, so to speak. And it's like, tell the other kids, it's an eclipse. The funny part about it was how few of them believed it. Mm. And that was, mm. for me, that's sort of a a, um, uh, a lesson in kind of communication of both science and, and other kinds of things that, you know, you realize something, it's so obvious. You just look at the damn <laughs> sun and it's, right, right, you know, it's right. got a big piece taken out of it. Right. It's like, oh, no, no, that can't happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that was, uh, I suppose that was a, a, um, a, a misconception among six-year-olds, at least, about right. um, these, nothing like that can happen. How can you cover a piece of the sun? That, 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 that isn't a thing. You know, I, I think in, um, in antiquity, people had, uh, well, people had this, I'm not sure how people really thought about eclipses in antiquity. I, I think, to me, it's a little bit surprising that there isn't more mention of eclipses in mythologies and so on because it must have been very weird because you know eclipses are, are rare enough that the typical person would have seen at most one eclipse one total eclipse in their life right there's really no possibility i mean in modern times when we know when eclipses are going to happen and people you know fly around the world and so on people can see lots of eclipses but in those days if you're hanging out you know in the in the stone age somewhere you know, and the sun suddenly goes out, it's like, wow, that's a really weird thing. And you yeah, say, right. I wonder whether that's going to happen again. It will never happen again in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's sort of surprising to me that there aren't more kind of mentions of eclipse-like phenomena in, in mythology and so on, because it's like once somebody's seen that, you know, everybody saw it together. It's like, what on earth is this thing? I mean, there's a, there's a story which is probably apocryphal, about Thales, a, a early kind of very early scientist, fifth century BC or so, where you know he was um, um, like many of those guys. He had kind of a theory of the world, and his theory of the world was everything is made of water, mm -hmm. and that's an interesting theory. 
because the idea that everything is made of one thing is something which in the things I've done in, about fundamental physics, we're back to the everything is made of one thing. It's not water anymore, but it's everything is, is made of sort of discrete atoms of space and, and so on. But anyway, he had that idea that everything's made of water, but supposedly he also had some degree of prediction of an eclipse and there was some battle where I think Greeks and Persians were, were yeah. bashing each other up. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then there's an eclipse and everybody's like, wow, what's that? And they all, they all kind of run away and the battle is run over. Away! <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, the world's ending. So why are we fighting each other type thing? It's, it's uh, you know, a, a kind of a world peace scheme, I suppose, is to, is, you know, have, the, have, a, have a weird thing happen where, where the sun looks like it's gone out. But I think that that um, that was a um, uh, uh, you know that that those kinds of things were were happening in antiquity. I, d I don't think people were you know I don't think people have been confused about what the sort of basic dynamics were. What's interesting is even in the time when people thought that the sun went around the Earth, people still knew that the moon was going between the sun and the Earth. Right. That was they, that was a was thing. Closer. Right. Right. And it was but but they knew that they didn't know, you know, kind of how all the they were very confused about a lot of things like like a big thing that confused them was the the retrograde motion of Mars in the sky that, you know, if you look at the 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 you know, where where Mars in the sky, it loops around and goes backwards. And that was kind of confusing. Um, but you could explain it with these epicycles, enough cogs and things. You know, there was a cog here and a cog there. And pretty soon it was going backwards. But I think that that. Um, uh, that that was um, yeah. So, um, but I, I, I guess in modern times, you know, there are effects around eclipses uh, that people might notice. I mean, I know, you know, I've seen two total solar eclipses in my life, um, and uh, one in 1991, one in 2017. And the 2017 eclipse, one of the things that uh, I saw was a thing called shadow bands which happen in some eclipses in some places for, for watching eclipses, which are a few minutes before the eclipse, everything starts shimmering. Right. Yes. Like the, yes. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, and I tried to take a video of it and my video was hopeless, but I think videos of shadow bands are essentially always hopeless, Right. Yeah. probably because it's an effect that doesn't really form an image in the same way that you expect when you're looking at something, you expect it's forming an image. If you look at a hologram, for example, a hologram doesn't form an image the same way that, like, you know, pixels on a computer screen form an image. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's the same type of thing, but it's some more kind of uh, phase of light holographic type effect, which is not readily picked up by a camera that's trying to imitate, uh, you know, that, that has its particular way of working. And finally, what's what's next for you, Stephen? What oh gosh, well, my life is complicated, and, and eclipses are a microscopic corner. I have to say of the things that I I like to do. I I've been interested in. Uh, uh, I mean, my my main day job for the last thirty seven years has been building our computational language to kind of express the world in computational terms. It's kind of like like there are these formalisms that you get for talking about the world. You can use, you know, natural language, you can use logic, you can use mathematics, and you can use computation as a way to kind of explain what's happening in the world. And the thing that I've been been interested in for the last, well, 40 years or so is kind of how do we make a notation for computation, just like we have a notation for mathematics, plus signs and equals signs and things like that. How do we make a notation for describing the world computationally and by the way, when we have that notation, we can actually do computations. Like, for example, for this eclipse, you know, when we're building this Precision Eclipse website, that's using our computational language. And in our computational language, we just have primitives that are things like astro position and so on, which represents the position of an astronomical object. And we're just computing things in terms of those primitives in our language. So it's kind of a, we, we're making the world computational so that we can compute things like when will the eclipse happen? So that's, that's kind of my, my main day job. My main um, uh, sort of one of my main hobbies, so to speak, is doing basic science and made a big breakthrough in, in uh, 2019, 2020 of figuring out sort of 
what the fundamental theory of physics is, what how the universe is put together at a fundamental level. And uh, it's, you know, it's one of these things where people have believed certain things about the universe for a long time that seem not to be true. Like one thing that's been a big issue ever since Thales and so on is, is the universe discrete or continuous? Hmm. Is the universe ultimately made of discrete things like atoms or is it ultimately continuous the way that, for example, water seems to be to us to us at the level we look at it. And that's been a debate that's gone back and forth for, for 2,000 years. And the thing that happened 100 years ago was people finally discovered matter is discrete. It's made of atoms. And then very soon thereafter, light is discrete. It's made of photons. But one thing which never got figured out is space. Space people still have thought is continuous. You can put things anywhere you want in space. And that's been sort of an assumption of mathematical physics for the last 2,000 years. Turns out we're pretty sure that assumption is wrong and that actually space is like matter, like light, is discrete. But it's a, it's a sort of funkier thing by the time space is discrete and you're kind of building up the universe from this whole network of discrete points. And in, in the end, what, what one thinks about is sort of the whole universe is made of this giant network of discrete points and every aspect of the universe, all the particles and light and everything in it is just some feature of this network. So one of the things that has been exciting recently is that we can figure out, well, we have this whole sort of theory of how physics works that's been really successful in reproducing what we know from 20th century physics. And uh, so, for example, it, it tells one things about black holes and so on, and uh, we can make nice simulations of how black holes work at sort of the very foundational level of how these atoms of space interact and how you end up getting black holes and so on there. And so, for example, one of the big questions is, can we, can we see, can we do an experiment that shows that space is discrete? Just like it took a lot of effort to discover that matter is discrete and to actually see the effects of molecules, can we find the analog of the effects of molecules, the, the thing that really, really uh, clinched it was Brownian motion. This, you look through a microscope and you look at little pollen grains, you can see they're getting kicked around. And what got figured out around 1900 is that the thing that's kicking them around is molecules of water and discrete molecules of water. And so the question is, can we find an analog of Brownian motion in physical space? And it looks like maybe there are effects to do with uh, kind of extreme black holes in which one should be able to see maybe, maybe in our time, maybe 100 years from now, one should be able to see the effect of the discreteness of space. So that's a that's an example of something I've been been interested in. It's kind of a uh, um, it's a it'll be a neat thing. I mean, what, one of the things that's a prediction of our theory is that we think of space as being three dimensional. You know, we can go in three different uh, three different directions in space, but in our theory, space ends up not being exactly three dimensional. Space ends up having fluctuations in dimensions. So you can have three point oh one dimensional space or 2.99 dimensional space. In the early universe, in our theory, space is was probably infinite dimensional. It kind of gradually got to the point where it's three dimensional, but we should be able to see in the current universe some fluctuations away from three dimensions. And that's the thing which again, if we manage to figure out that, oh, you look through this space telescope in this way, then you see this thing that's a totally bizarre effect that is a consequence of a, of a dimension fluctuation in space. That's a that's a, a really a neat thing to see. So that that's some. Um, uh, if but um, uh, in um, uh, the uh, so my my interest is is um, uh, kind of to understand things about the universe at a sort of foundational level, and it's turned out the computation is the tool one seems to need, and by the way that tool turns out to be super useful for the very practical things people do. I mean, kind of the, the thing that, uh, you know, has happened in modern times, the last 300 years, we've been kind of, we've had mathematics as a tool and it's given us a lot of the kinds of engineering that we have and so on. The thing to realize is that sort of just as there's been a mathematical science, there's also a science that's fundamentally based on computation and there's sort of in every area of, of science and technology and so on, there are sort of new things that you get to discover if you think in computational terms. And that's been 
the thing that, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to live at a time in history when sort of the idea of computation first got to the point where you could really do serious things with it. And I've had a great time trying to do that. And so that's, that's the main thing I do. And the Eclipse is just a great example of where this kind of you can compute things about the world really worked great. So that's that's kind of the, the, the attraction of that. That's fabulous. Well, best of luck to you on everything you do, Stephen. Thank you. And uh, um, thanks for being thanks so much for being on the show and welcome back anytime. Thanks. And that was uh, Stephen Wolfram, creator of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Language, and founder of CEO of uh, Wolfram Research. Check out his new book. Predicting the Eclipse, a Multillennium Tale of Computation. Thank you. So, the next time you witness an eclipse, and I hope it's the 8th of April, take a moment to appreciate the long and storied history of eclipse forecasting. From ancient fears to modern science, it's a testament to the human spirit of curiosity and exploration that has propelled us forward for millennia. Who knows what discoveries and advancements the future holds in the fascinating world of eclipse prediction. Now, maybe we can take lessons from from one ancient legend of eclipses. The Batmaliba of Togo and Benin have a legend that eclipses are the result of the sun and moon fighting. The only way to end the battle, their stories tell, is for people around the world to stop fighting amongst ourselves. That's not such a terrible lesson. Next week, we're going to be talking with experimental physicist at CERN and acclaimed science presenter Harry Cliff about the strangest anomalies of the universe and his new book, Space Oddities. Make sure to join us starting on the 30th of March. The following week, on the 6th of April, we're going to give you a viewing guide to the solar eclipse happening two days later, so don't miss either episode. How do I make sure I see every episode in all your really cool films? Great question. Head on over to our substack at thecosmiccompanion.com and sign up for our newsletters. Subscribe for free or treat yourself to a VIP subscription starting at just $5 a month. What a deal. Yep. What a deal. Clear skies. <laughs>